Welcome to today's vital conversation with our community, Welcoming the Stranger, a dialogue with leaders regarding IM's work in refugee resettlement and welcoming the stranger. Interfaith Ministries is pleased to be able to host these virtual conversations on topics with people and organizations in our community addressing crucial issues. We offer our thanks for the support of Sitco Petroleum Corporation as the sponsor of our whole 2021 series. Before I proceed, just a reminder that this event is both being recorded and live streamed to IAM's Facebook page. Thank you all who are joining us here in Zoom. Please keep yourselves muted and please use the chat box to send me any questions along the way. Again, we welcome those who are joining us via Facebook Live. Final conversations emerged after the death of George Floyd, a son of Houston's Third Ward, in May of 2020 in Minneapolis, Minnesota. In June, we brought our three amigos, Reverend William Lawson, Archbishop Joe Fiorenza, and Rabbi Sam Karf, into dialogue to begin this series. It would be the final time that the three amigos would be together in the same place as Rabbi Karf died uh, on August, uh, last August. Our fall 2020 series covered a wide range of topics and highlighted incredible Houston-based nonprofits and organizations making an impact on our communities. We began our 2021 series in July with a conversation with Ashley Johnson and Jonathan Brooks from Link Houston about transportation and equity. Our August Vital Conversation with Eileen Morris and Rachel Hill Dixon featured the Ensemble Theater, and then we welcome Brandy Holmes and Rachel Schneider from Project Curate on the Spirit of Social Change. And uh, please visit www.imgh.org to learn more about Interfaith Ministries' work and how to donate. At imgh.org, you can learn about our overall work in the community. You can learn more about our 2021 series as well. Today, our theme is Welcoming the Stranger, and we highlight the work of refugee services at Interfaith Ministries. It may seem odd to feature ourselves in a vital conversation. It is not our intent for the vital conversation to be an advertisement for our work, though we hope it very much is because of the importance of this work. But there is a historic situation unfolding and Houston and Inter Interfaith Ministries are right in the middle of it. This is a vital issue affecting our community and I am just so happens to be a significant part of addressing welcoming refugees into our community as we have done so for 30 years. We have done so because welcoming the stranger is a core tenet of every major religious tradition. When you examine the constants through the values, the scriptures, the stories, and the overall witness of religious communities, the offering of refuge and hospitality is unmistakably present. Many major religions were born in times of oppression or of forced migration, of people seeking better lives for themselves and their families. They were born in times of wandering, of transience, of instability. These faiths do not forget that they were shown hospitality in new lands, and so they call for their adherence to show that same hospitality. For my own Christian faith, I'll quote just one verse from the letter to the Hebrews, do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing so, people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Welcoming the stranger is a core practice and is one reason why I am has practiced it through the work of refugee resettlement. Let's hear then in her own words from Sangha, a newly resettled refugee from Afghanistan who is also highlighted in a re recent CW39 newscast. Uh, my name is Sangha. Uh, I am a wife and mother of three children. Uh, I am from Afghanistan. Uh, I have worked for USAID in Afghanistan uh, in uh, Jalalabad and Kabul and that's my story. Well, since the U.S. actually pulled back its support in Afghanistan and removed its troops, many Afghans were left in a life-threatening situation. And for those who could not flee, of course, they were able, they had to stay. But others who could flee came here to America, which was mainly, for many, their only option they had. CW39 Sydney Simone shares us more on how now a new refugee family is finally able to resettle right here in Houston. Tell us more, Sydney. Well, good morning, Sharon. Since the beginning of July, Interfaith Ministries has resettled 116 refugees from eight different countries. Of those, 66 are Afghans, and one family says they decided to leave before it was too late. Hello. How are you doing? This is Sangha. 
For safety concerns, she doesn't want to reveal her identity. Sangha worked for the United States in Jalalabad, Afghanistan. One day, she received a notice to leave work because she and other women were working against the Taliban. After a few months, Saga says her family was in danger. Because her family was not safe and did not have enough security, they had no choice but to leave their home country. Now she lives in Houston, Texas, with her husband, Murad, and their three sons. Sangha says, we applied for an SIV, special immigrant visa. After two years, we were approved to come to America. Now, my family is comfortable here because we feel secure. When I asked Sangha what her family is looking forward to the most, she said future and freedom. Her husband recently started a job, and her two oldest sons are in school. Sangha says America can provide her family with a lifetime of opportunities. Sangha says she feels relief knowing that they are safe, but leaving her family members behind was the hardest thing she's had to face leaving Afghanistan. They're not safe. Sangha says they're a target for the Taliban, and that's what worries her. I asked Sangha if there were plans to return to her hometown. Right now, the answer is no because it's too dangerous. She says if things return to normal and everyone is safe and free, she and Murad will consider going back. For now, their focus is on building a better life for their boys. Sangha and Murad's kids are two, six, and eight. She says her older boys saw everything. In Sangha's words, they felt the hardships from the Taliban. They understand the situation better than us, so much that they would play fights and imitate the violent things they saw back in Afghanistan. We want to protect them from that. In the midst of the chaos, Sangha has words of encouragement for people experiencing the same thing. She says, stay focused, keep trying to better yourself. It's a beneficial sacrifice and you can have everything here. And the organization plans to resettle about 1,000 more refugees by March of 2022. Reporting live, Sydney Simone, CW39, Houston. So for our panel today, we welcome Martin B. Kaminsky. Since summer of 2015, Martin has served as our president and CEO of Interfaith Ministries, providing the leadership and vision for all of our programs. And Martin will provide an overview of our work. Also welcome Elena Corbett, Community Engagement Manager for Refugee Services, and she'll share more specific information about our current situation. We also welcome Rabbi Oren Hayon of Congregation Emmanuel, who also serves as chair of our Refugee Services Committee. And finally, Tamina Masood, our Super Volunteer and Community Outreach Liaison. Thank you all for being here. I'm going to go ahead and stop my share. And... Um, We'll get right on to Martin. Martin, it's great to have you here. Oh, do you are you still having trouble with your um there? Let me try to get you to unmute. Uh, we can okay. there we go. Oh, uh, you had to hold on one second. We're gonna just change that. And that should not be a problem. Martin, it's good to have you with us. Thank you for uh for being the first with us here. Um Martin, can you share briefly about what interface interfaith ministries is and its vision? Sure, Greg. Um, thank you all for being on the call today. Interfaith Ministries is a multifaceted organization concerned and compassionate with people in need throughout the community. Our mission statement says that we bring diverse people of faith together for dialogue, collaboration, and service. And today we're doing that. We're beginning with this dialogue and having the opportunity to help you understand uh, what's going on in the community, uh, why uh, the need has come to us, and then to talk about how we can work together to respond to that need and ultimately to provide the service to those many Afghans who are coming to our city soon. We're expecting three to 4,000 in our larger Houston community. And uh, I am is now prepared and ready to serve a thousand of those directly through our own services. This is something that we need your help on. And we'll be talking about the many ways that you can do that, the religious and philosophical beliefs behind it, and uh, what you can do directly to give assistance. Um, IM has been around for more than 50 years. Before that, it was a group of Protestant churches who came together to give compassion to those in need. And ultimately, over the years, 
Uh, it added uh, the Jewish Catholic communities, became interfaith, became, I'm sorry, uh, Houston Metropolitan Ministries, and in more recent years has become interfaith ministries for greater Houston, bringing the people of all faiths together and people of no particular faith. But our goal is to look at needs in the community that are unmet and look at the best way that we can solve those problems. And the best way that we can do that is really through the social capital of the people on this call, of the connections that you have, of the compassion that you can show. And our work is very much based on a service initiative and the kind of goals that we can bring together when uh, everyone is working in the same direction, acknowledges a problem and solves it. Um, we have uh, four major program areas. Um, one of them, of course, is Meals on Wheels. We're the largest Meals on Wheels provider in Texas, probably among the top five in the United States, serving 5,000 meals a day to seniors in need. And this is all about the compassion that we have that we should not let the infirm and the seniors in our community walk alone and that we always want to be there to help them. And a meal and more is one of the best ways we can do that. And so Meals on Wheels and then caring for the pets and animals of our seniors is also uh, an important part of the work we do. Another area that we work in uh, is that of interfaith relations. And it's calls like this that uh, give people a chance to talk together, to understand through the different lenses of different faiths, um, what does our scripture say? What do our values in our own faith say about the things we need to do? And I think you'll hear from Reverend Han and Rabbi Hayon and others, many references to those uh, faith responsibilities that we have uh, in our religion, or just the humanistic responsibilities that anyone in our city would want to have. We are also a volunteer Houston, which is our direct effort at service of matching people of all ages uh, with nonprofits and public uh, needs in the community. We come into play during a disaster when people are in special need and try to help them, comfort them, and restore their, their homes. Uh, we also come together uh, just in routine things to help uh, those that are in need uh, through the matching of uh, joining Volunteer Houston, going to volunteerhouston.org, being able to put in what you're interested in, what time you have to give, where you can give it, and you'll be offered several recommendations of agencies that you can sign up with online to, to volunteer with. And our latest effort is our Serve Houston effort, which is really about getting young people involved in servant, servant leadership and really understanding their responsibility as they grow into adulthood to uh, be able to learn the methods of how they can analyze needs in the community, they can support them, and they can really be leaders in our community to respond to those needs. Houston is, is a greater Houston when we all come together and so this effort of intersection among faiths, of social capital, of bringing people that can bring people together and bring a solution to the community is important. And we're, we hope that we're an important part and play an important profile in that area. Um, I'll then mention our fourth area is essentially uh, refugee services and refugee resettlement. And we are now um, on one of the longest and uh, largest efforts to resettle refugees. We've done this for more than 30 years, so we're pretty expert at it. But never have we had so many people want to come to our community so fast uh, and with such large families at one time. And so we'll spend a lot of time in this call of how do we get here? How do we help other people get here and support our work? And how do we work together to acculturate uh, Afghans to our community, to help learn from them, to experience new foods, new customs, new languages, uh, and to come together in the greater Houston that we always are when we do find that opportunity to come together. Great. Martin, 
Martin, thank you. That's a wonderful overview, particularly I appreciate you and again, concluding with refugee services because and, and recognizing that this is something that you all that we have done for 30 plus years and didn't just start it six months ago. We have a, a long track record, but um, we're in a particular historic time here, which is again why we've chosen to um, to, to focus this vital conversation on refugee resettlement. And with that, I wanna to turn to Elena Corbett to help us walk through the specifics of our, of our, our specific situation here. Again, Elena serves as our community, uh, community engagement manager for refugee services. And she's gonna help us understand what's going on right now in particular, in particularly with our Afghan allies and what's made things so pressing. Again, I'm not, going, I'm not asking her to summarize 20 years of American presence in Afghanistan, but more, what's going on here in Houston. So Elena, let me turn to you and just start with a direct question. Who are the Afghans coming to Houston and why are they coming? Um, thank you, Greg. And it's, it's such a pleasure to, to be on this call um, to share the most up-to-date information that, that I have with everybody. Um, well, Greg, it's, it's important to notice that, you know, the individuals that you were seeing arrive in Houston they fled Afghanistan under very difficult circumstances. I'm sure we're all aware of them and we watched, you know, the images and the news of planes, cargo planes loaded with, uh, with these Afghan nationals. So the population that's arriving, it's a mix of um, APAs, and I'm going to uh, make sure that, that I'll explain each term. Um, so APAs are the Afghanistan Placement Assistance Program. So we're referring to um, the APAs that are coming to Houston, um, and we differentiate that a little bit with other populations, such as um, SIVs, special immigrant visa holders, who also are coming at the same time through very similar circumstances. So some of the individuals that we've seen arrive, they had already started their a process of um, becoming an, an SIV, and others that have not, they are given a humanitarian parole and that's why we refer to uh, this wave of, of Afghans as parolees, because they received a humanitarian parole, so they're here in the U.S. legally. And they have been um, on the U.S. military basis for over a month now, where they are undergoing a variety of checks, you know, background checks, medical checks. Um, those that started the, the process of applying to um, become an SIV, and an SIV is um, somebody who um, has worked with U.S. troops, either Iraqi or Afghani, we're in this case referring to Afghan SIVs, and they worked as translators or interpreters with, uh, with U.S. armed forces for several years. And this, uh, in turn, uh, put their lives in danger and lives of their family members in, in danger. Um, you know, obviously, because it, it was such a um, hectic process of you know, withdrawing from, from Afghanistan, um, we um, receive you know, very basic information about the cases that are coming in. And um, this is what makes it a little bit different from how we typically resettle refugees. Um, with refugee resettlement, you know, we would typically get information about a case with a lot of details, with several weeks, maybe even months in advance, um, to where we would assure a case and we would say, based on the information that's given to us, whether it's, you know, gender, um, age, employment, uh, language skills, we will assure, we will be responsible for settling this case. And so this gives us time to, you know, prep for, for this arrival and um, set up, you know, apartments and really, you know, prepare ourselves for, for the case that's coming in. With um, the um, Afghan parolees, with, with APAs, um, you know, on some days we're, we're just getting several hours of notice um, and then, you know, clients uh, are at the airport and our caseworkers are uh, rushing to, to meet them um, and support them. But we're extremely fortunate to be in the, um, you know, position that we are having done this work for so many years, for over um, 30 years, but also having really um, supportive community and community partners that are making this, you know, hectic and fluid situation um, a lot more manageable than it otherwise would have been. Um, and as Martin had mentioned, we're uh, expecting to to see. You know, we've seen about 100 individuals so far. Uh, we are preparing ourselves for um, probably seeing close to 2,000 
Um, and we, we think that this will happen over the next several months, so maybe two or three months where we'll see these waves um, of, of Avian uh, parole is coming to, to us. Um, and so what our staff, all staff, uh, caseworkers, you know, people that work in my uh, sort of sub-department and really everybody else, we are operating in crisis mode. So we are here to support every single case that arrives, whether it means delivering a hot meal to a newly arrived refugee family, picking them up from um, you know, the, the airport and showing them um, the, the apartment, making sure that they understand how to use all the, um, the appliances. And so it, we could not do this without the support of our community partners and our volunteers. And I'll put a, a shameless plug here for um, Volunteer Houston, because this is where we are ad advertising our most uh, pressing needs for volunteers. So we have um, seven positions right now. So if you are interested in helping us with uh, whether it's airport service, again, delivering hot meals, grocery shopping, working in the office, helping us for donations, you um, will be able to create a, a profile in, in the Volunteer Houston uh, portal and then search for uh, Interfaith Ministries Refugee Services Volunteer Opportunities. And we uh, definitely need, need all hands on, on deck at this point. Um, so, you know, the, the population that they were, they were seeing, the Afghan parolees, um, they're also coming from, um, you know, such, a, such anxiety and, and, and place of stress. So what we're also doing is we are, um, we started a women's empowerment group in 2019 for Afghan uh, refugee women. So that, that group has been uh, running for several years and, um, you know, host workshops, informational workshops. Uh, but also advocate for each um, refugee woman in that program. And because we knew that we needed to respond to the newly arrived um, Afghan refugee women or refugee uh, or parolees, we created a special program, which is a very kind of deep dive into cultural orientation to make sure that we're able to answer all of their questions and make them feel supported. And the women from the original Afghan group are now part, are welcoming these newly arrived um, women from, from Afghanistan. So we, we've been very lucky to, to, help, to have their help. Um, and then, you know, we are um, obviously working with volunteers and um, groups that are want to, uh, wanting to co-sponsor, faith-based partners that are wanting to co-sponsor uh, refugee families. Uh, because we know that, you know, this hectic situation um, will be um, slightly hectic for, you know, for a few more months. And we know that um, our clients need all the support that they can get because, you know, um, th there's very little time to make them um, self-sufficient where they will be able to um, get jobs and start working right away and support th themselves. So we're trying to cover all of our bases and uh, really relying on um, our volunteers and, and our staff um, to prep for for every single arrival, no matter how uh, you know how many hours in advance uh, we have. Um, we are also, as I mentioned, preparing for a very large number of, of arrivals um, and are on standby, literally you know every day, um, awaiting the the information. And we've um, been really lucky to have volunteers that have welcomed these families at the airport and has helped with, um, you know, things like transporting their luggage. In most cases, people are arriving without luggage. So they're starting from scratch and they need absolutely everything. They need, you know, appliances, they need um, furniture in, in the apartments that we're supplying them with. Um, and, you know, as we know, the, the housing costs, unfortunately, in Houston have risen uh, and partially during uh, COVID and, and the prices continue to, um, to climb. So we're uh, fundraising around the clock um, to support our clients the best way we can. And we're also working with the Refugee Consortium, which, uh, you know, there are four other refugee resettlement agencies in Houston. So we're in daily communications, um, trying to troubleshoot and problem solve um, and really work, work on this um, together as we always historically have, have done. Um, let me let, let me yeah. just let me follow up on a couple. Um, so, 
who would you be able to again respecting confidentiality just maybe give a couple of concrete examples of who they are why why, why is it that they had to flee afghanistan and we've welcomed them to america and into the houston area what what what, what were they doing in afghanistan right so they were associated with uh with us in one capacity or another so some of them may have worked for uh, an ngo that had operations in Kabul or the surrounding um, areas, or they are um, SIVs that haven't completed their special immigrant visa holder process, uh, but they have translated and interpreted for U.S. Army forces for uh, many years, and their family um, and uh, and their relatives' lives uh, were put in danger because of their affiliation with, with the U.S. You know, we are seeing um, a little bit of everything. You know, some of these cases are individual cases, so perhaps it's a um, spouse of an SIV that's already here in Houston and they have been reunited. We've had several cases like that, which was very touching to see, especially uh, in the airport. Um, we're, we're also seeing you know, entire families. We had a family of 10 that we, we settled last week. So there were a lot of needs to support uh, you know, children. Um, we've seen some very young children most recently um, one of our clients actually gave birth here in the U.S. in the, in the military base, so um, you know her, her baby was four years old by by the time that they got to us to to Houston. So it's it's you know we're seeing um, a variety of, of cases, but all of them have fled for um, you know for fear or persecution and, and their connection to um, to either U.S. Army or the U.S. Super. And I think the last question, and I see questions starting to come into the chat box, and thank you, and we'll be getting to those at some point, whether now or right at the end. Refugees have been coming to the Houston area through various agencies, including interfaith ministries, you know, for, for, for many, many years. How historic is the situation now? When, when we look back 10 years from now, what will we say about this particular moment? You know, we will say that this was an unprecedented situation in which we reacted very uh, swiftly and, you know, really came together. And, you know, this is uh, obviously thanks to our experience in the refugee resettlement uh, sector for over um, 30 years. And, you know, I, I think that looking back at it, we'll, um, we'll, we'll just realize how much we have done um, under, you know, the, the strain, under the pressure of, uh, you know, making sure that this is done in a timely manner, while we're also trying to run all of our existing programs, like the women's empowerment groups for Arabic women and, and Afghan women. But, you know, I, I think that we will be able to look back at this event, um, and, uh, you know, it, 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 it will be uh, uh, something for, for the history, <laughs> right? Because you know, I have been in this sector for for many years, and I, you know, have seen the um, the Syrian refugee crisis, but nothing has really compared to the situation on the scale of how many people entered the country in a very short period of time. Um, and I feel very confident that we will uh, handle this as well as we have been handling, um, and you know, uh, we'll continue to um, to operate. Um, and in, in resettle, you know, regular refugees, but also resettle this very large wave of um, Afghan parolees. Super. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. Again, thank you for offering the questions. I see them in the chat box, um, as well as um, um, I, I think, and with follow-up emails, if you are registered, we'll send again some vocabulary, the APA, SIV, parole, and hopefully we can kind of come back to some vocabulary as well. Elena, thank you so much. Um, at this time, I, before we transition over to hear from Rabbi Oren Hayon and Timina Masood, I'd like to show another brief video, kind of adding a, 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 a continued face to, uh, to what we're experiencing right now. Just give me one second, and I will get there. Let's take a look. I apply for SIV uh, from um, two years ago. After uh, one year, I got my approval, and then I process my another st uh, step of the case. So around two months, I'm in uh, Houston, Texas. Uh, no, uh, I came direct to uh, from Afghanistan to Qatar then from Qatar to Washington, and from Washington to uh, Texas, Houston city. Security is very important for us. 
I'm happy because of uh, in Houston uh, we feel secure and uh, there is many Afghan uh, people and we not feel uh, alone ourselves and there is a lot of opportunity for women and I can work here and there is uh, opportunity for uh, uh, improving uh, my education. Uh, so that is, uh, I'm very, really, really happy for these things. When we came here, uh, they give us home uh, and uh, they give us opportunity for work, for education, and uh, um, we can do uh, everything we want here. Um, I like my home because uh, that same is uh, that uh, I wish to have a home like that. <laughs> yeah. Let me turn then to, actually, she was part of the interview, Tamina Masood. Uh, thank you for being with us, Tamina, our super volunteer, and, and much more when it comes to refugee services. Tamina, your dedication to helping refugees and working with IM is admirable. Again, I'm not asking you to be a religious scholar with this question, but how does your, your faith as being Muslim inform your efforts to welcome the stranger? And then I'm going to ask you to just highlight one thing, or else we could be here for many hours, uh, but one thing that you have done to help. Tamina, I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, uh, Greg, and uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakat. Uh, with the name of Allah, uh, the most uh, merciful and most compassionate. Uh, peace and blessings upon all my friends that are joining us today. Uh, Islamic history teaches us about two great migrations. Uh, the first being that led by Prophet Moses, alayhi salam, peace be upon him. And the second, which was termed as the Hijra where Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was instructed to leave the city of Mecca, where prosecution had become to the point where his life was endangered. And he was commanded to, with himself and the followers, go to the city of Medina. That particular migration was going to be known in, in history as the, the relationship of the establishment of relationship between the Mahajir the Mahajir meaning those that were leaving the migrants and the Ansar, the ones, the helpers. Um, that is the background that I learned growing up in Pakistan. And coupled with that, uh, I developed two role models for myself. One was the role model that I did not see uh, and uh, hear directly, but learn about in the books, that being the Prophet Wasallam, And the second, my mother, in Finch, and who was in the house with me. Uh, my mother uh, spent her entire life uh, either in hospitals, orphanages, or mental institutions because she believed that life was about giving back and helping those that need help. The Quran talks about giving as well, and uh, it guides us, it, it encourages, encourages us to help the less fortunate and we can do that in two terms. One, we can give in terms of kind donations, and the other we could do in terms of our own self. So it was not a strange thing to me that when I moved to Houston 25 years ago, uh, and I was introduced to Interfaith Ministries Dinner Dialogue, Elliot at that time, who was the president and CEO, uh, told me to come and have a look at the refugee services. And uh, that was when I knew that I had found my calling and uh, the teachings that I learned in the Quran to give to those who are requiring love and affection, not to make any judgmental uh, thoughts about whether the way the person is coming from, uh, to also respect the dignity of each individual. That all the Quran had taught me before I came here. So I found myself in a great ideal situation to practice what I had learned. And I'm very grateful to Interfaith Ministries for allowing me to not only follow my desires, but actually practice my religion also. Refugee services has become a part of my life. It's, it's a second nature to me. And how that works is that uh, once the family is received by the Interfaith Ministries Refugee Services, I go and visit them. I'm very strong on human contact and interaction. And uh, I go, I sit with them, and I try to identify what else can I do that has 
uh, not been already taken care of by the official uh, uh, quorum at the IM. Uh, what that allows me to do is get to know them and they get to see a person uh, who can sit down and offers a friendship along with the way of, with, with offering them to help as well. Uh, I will say that I am very fortunate to be living in a generous community like Houston, where it is only a matter of one text or one phone call that I make and people come up with whatever is required to do. In case of this Afghanistan issue, I, I do agree the magnitude is something that I have not myself seen in the past 15 years of my volunteer work. The scope, the, the size of the family coming in, the, the large numbers that are coming in, it is overwhelming by all means. So we've had to mobilize resources that we've never done in such a short period of time. But I will be very honest to tell you that I'm amazed and I'm just amazed at how much people are coming forward in helping, not only in terms of uh, taking the donations, but in terms of taking the families to go shopping, because this is a new land for them. They don't necessarily know the language. They don't necessarily know the law of the land. So volunteer work is gone to a new level where we don't have to only teach them maybe how to do something, we have to offer love and affection and friendship while doing that because they're scared. And uh, I keep reminding myself that every time I go and meet these families, I am doing volunteer work, but believe it or not, I'm practicing my religion as well. The, the Quran has told me that God has given intrinsic dignity to each child of Adam. God also tells me that I should do what I believe in, and I feel that my work is actually allowing me to do that every single day. My, my, my team workers at IAM often ask me, why don't you get tired, tired. Or, or when do you sleep? And I tell them that, you know what, honestly, in the morning when I get up, my, my whole aim is to sit in front of the computer and find out how many families can I help because I feel that I'm reporting to my duty, my job, and that is service to my, my Lord. So it is just a very humbling experience that I, that I actually do every day. And I have had to increase the amount of time that I'm spending now, but it's not that I, I feel that I'm compromising my own self. It's just that I feel that I'm being able to get to more people now, and I'm make, being able to make a difference with the support of the community. And one thing I will like to mention in case of this Afghanistan issue, I was actually out of the country when this started happening. But to the strength of our community, we, I started calling up the, the, the members here and I was with the generosity that exists in Houston, able to raise funds to get six cars for six families and let me tell you, my dear friends, a car goes a long way here. It car, a car does not only signify a drive to the employment, it can allow a family to get access to resources they would not be able to do otherwise. I have met families who have not had transportation, who've had to actually walk half an hour to just go and get their kids from school. I've met families who've had to go in the rain to go buy groceries. So I have seen the value of transportation. And I honestly salute you all for continuing to be there, to continue to support in the resettlement of these families. And it goes a long way. The youngsters, the young kids that I see, for them, this is, it is all new and scary. They, they need to see human beings come forward and offer friendship. They would need a lot of help in schools. They would need a lot of support to get used to the new culture. So I, as a volunteer, request you out there, if you have the time, even if an hour a week, please don't hesitate to come forward. Your money is going a long way. The in-kind donations is going a long way. But I tell you what you can do with your presence it cannot replicate any other thing. 
and I firsthand see the impact regularly on a daily basis. Super. And what great thing that you can practice your human faith and your religious faith at the same time, as Martin said. I don't, don't think you can get an opportunity better than this. Thank you, Tamina, so, so, so very much. I think maybe to segue, I'm going to add in uh, Rabbi Oren Hayon um, and ask him also to chime in. You've been chair of our Refugee Services Committee and involved with refugee resettlement through your work leading Congregation Emmanuel. How does your Jewish faith inform your efforts? And I think we heard from Tamina about uh, an individual effort, but perhaps you can talk about what a community can do to, to support this need as well. Rabbi Hayon, it's great to see you. Sure. Thanks, Greg. Great to be with you. Great to be with all these inspiring leaders and volunteers uh, and folks who are doing this extraordinary work for our community and really for our country. Um, I, a few of the things that Tamina said really uh, resonated with my own uh, spiritual experience as a Jew, as a leader of the Jewish community. Um, we also have a, a history that tells stories about rootlessness and exile, um, homelessness and need, feeling um, not at home in the places where we live and just feeling a real deep-seated yearning to, to get to a place where we feel welcomed and, and at home. Um, in our scriptural tradition, which is probably the, the earliest place we can look for the reasons why uh, the Jewish community feels moved to do this work, um, the commandment to, to welcome the stranger, which after all is the, the convening phrase under which we're gathered today, uh, that commandment is repeated literally dozens of times uh, in the Jewish scripture. If you go through and, and read your Hebrew Bible, uh, you'll go through and find that commandment repeated more often than just about any other uh, commandment you could imagine being associated with Jewish life. We, we hear that commandment uh, offered to the ancient Israelites more often than the commandment um, to, uh, to avoid eating pork or to, uh, to avoid robbery or theft. I mean, all of these things that, that we understand to be the major moral underpinnings of, uh, of Jewish religious life, uh, the most common and the most uh, frequently emphasized is the commandment to, to welcome the stranger. Um, and in most of those cases, the scripture says, you are obligated to welcome the stranger because you know what it feels like. You know what it feels like to be in a place where you're not at home, where you're not welcomed, when you need to rely on the kindness and the hospitality and the resources of strangers uh, to protect your family and to, to come to a place uh, where you can be safe and secure. So that, that, um, that spiritual objective is longstanding uh, and very prominent in the, the construction of a, of a Jewish ethical response um, to refugees. Um, I think from a more modern perspective, uh, the vast majority of, uh, of North American Jews um, have a story in their histories. Most of us not more removed than a couple of generations, um, feelings of uh, gratitude and indebtedness to this country um, that welcomed us in and made us feel at home um, to this place that offered us liberty and opportunity. Um, in many cases, when we were escaping other settings where we didn't have those opportunities and those protections. So for many North American Jews, those those experiences are very personal and bring us to this work out of a sense of wanting to give back to the country that helped our own families. Um, and on a, on a sadder and more difficult note, we also have um, tragic memories like the experience, for example, during the, the Second World War of uh, the SS St. Louis which if you don't know the story, is a story about a, a German ocean liner um, filled with nearly a thousand refugees fleeing Nazi Germany, trying to make their way from Europe to the United States. And the ship made it all the way to the coast of the United States, so close, according to the accounts, so close that the passengers could see the lights of Miami on the coastline. They got that close to the United States and our country turned the ship away, sent the ship and all of its passengers back to Europe and when they got back to Europe, hundreds of those passengers were murdered in the Holocaust. So we have examples in our own community, in our own nation's history, about what the stakes are of our decisions about hospitality and welcome and taking care of people who are fleeing some of the most heartbreaking and unthinkable and brutal situations in other parts of the world. The stakes are, uh, are infinitely high. And we, just like Tamina said, in the, in the Muslim tradition, we have a, a very central Jewish ethical obligation to look out for those who depend on us for their care um, and hospitality. Um, so to your question, Greg, about um, 
what can a congregation do? What can individual members of a, of a spiritual community do? I would underscore everything that Tamina said. Um, there are, of course, limits about what regular sort of civilian people on the street can do. A lot of these decisions are made um, on the national level and are uh, with, by our lawmakers in Congress. Um, a lot of these decisions are made by policy set at the Department of State. Not every Houstonian on the street has access to those decision-making levers um, about what our national refugee policy will be. Um, but all of us have the opportunity to do something. For some of us, we are able to write a check to help uh, defray the, the monumental costs of welcoming and resettling these new Americas, new Americans. Some of us have the opportunity to, to provide goods, services, uh, furniture, cars, clothing, toys. Some of that, some of us have that sort of work within our reach. Um, and I would say, honestly, for those of us that don't have the, the uh, possibility, the, the capacity to, to give generously in material ways, um, Greg, I'd go back to the, the beautiful teaching you opened with this afternoon that um, I would love to see every Houstonian work on continuing to cultivate uh, a spirit of hospitality and welcome. Um, every single one of us have had an experience when we walked into a room and we were new there and we didn't feel at home. And we, for many of us, if we were lucky, we had the experience of finding someone there who helped us feel welcome and be at home. Um, all of us can do that with our neighbors, with these new Houstonians, um, in many cases with these uh, Afghan refugees who have put extraordinarily things on the line uh, to serve our country overseas. Oren, thank you so, so very much. And thank you for your leadership. And uh, thank you as well for uh, Congregation Emmanuel's support of, of Interfaith Ministries. Um, let me uh, turn to some question. There's uh, some Q&A. And, um, and then I think Martin will, uh, I think, have a, be able to address some things that you can do. Let me actually turn to Elena. There were some questions um, in, the, in the chat box. There was one, who should I contact about in-kind donations, furniture, for example? And then another question, is there a need for a church to sponsor a family? Where will the family be located? I think, Elena, um, I think you can briefly, I think you're the right person to address those two questions. Yes, and I will, I've been uh, trying to respond individually as well as these questions are popping up in the, in the chat box. Um, yes, yeah, so please feel free to reach out to me. I posted my um, email address in the chat box just now, ecorbit at imgh.org. I will have to say that we're being cautious about furniture donations because we were overwhelmed. It's a good problem to have by the generosity of the Houstonians. So what we're trying to do as we prepare and as we find out, you know, which arrivals which will take place this week or next week is to ask people to, you know, first of all, they can send us pictures, they can send these pictures to me of their furniture so we can decide whether this will be a good fit for the apartment that we're trying to furnish. But also if you're able to hold on to some of the furniture just a little while longer, uh, because we would love to, to move the furniture directly from, um, from your place to the apartment where refugee clients will, will live. We do, we do uh, have an Amazon wish list that we posted on our website and I'll post uh, here in the chat in just a second. We are prioritizing, um, you know, gift cards because it's very important to give sort of the ownership of the process to the family, right? So they can buy things that we haven't thought about, maybe, you know, small things that we missed that, that they need for, for, for themselves, for their kids, for their other um, family members. Um, and then we are absolutely looking for co-sponsors from faith-based community, and those questions can um, also come to me. Um, you know, we ask for a six-month commitment, and we do um, ask to fundraise to cover several months of, of rent and, you know, potentially other bills to help this family just get on their feet and become, you know, independent um, in a very short amount uh, of time. Um, and it's extremely helpful to me. One of the most, and Tamina spoke about this so well today, it's that connection, right? Because when you are, uh, when you arrive in the US under these very stressful um, conditions, it may take you some time to connect with somebody from the local community. And we're doing this through our sponsors, we're doing this through our individual volunteers. Um, and that makes such a difference for somebody that, that just survived this uh, you know, uh, tragic and, and uh, you know, depressing ordeal to have the support of the volunteers. Um, and I always say, do not worry about the, the language barrier. Uh, some of our Afghan uh, um, refugees there, they may speak 
some English, some uh, don't speak any English at all, but it also forces you to communicate and therefore uh, uh, makes our refugee families learn English also a little bit faster through that difficulty, through the uh, overcoming the, that obstacle. Um, I did see a question here also about uh, refugee benefits. Um, this was the news that oh, we've hey. been... Elena, yeah. I'm going to ask that. I'm going to ask Ali to address that oh, yes. one as well as the other one. So super. I'd like to recognize uh, Ali Al Sudani, our chief programs officer, and ask him to address two questions that were asked. What will be IAM's role in the refugee benefits recently approved by Congress? And then there was a question about can refugees get, I guess, and this uh, the question specifically about, I guess, getting money out of Afghanistan, but maybe just larger, can they get anything out of Af Afghanistan? Um, Ali, let me go ahead and ask you to unmute. And I think we'll be able to hear from you. There you Thank are. You. Thank you for, uh, for this opportunity and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being on the call. When it comes to the role of Interfaith Ministries Refugee Services in um, processing the benefits of refugees uh, that the Congress recently approved, we will be helping um, the Afghan parolees in um, completing their applications for food stamp, Medicaid, and uh, other refugee cash assistance program. But we know already that there is a delay. Sometimes actually it takes two months for a food stamp application to be approved from the time we submit the application until the time they are approved for this. So we are very grateful that the parolees, Afghan parolees were granted this, um, 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 these benefits and they can access these benefits, but we also very mindful of uh, the delay in getting these benefits due to COVID and the status of the Afghan parolees and um, you know, all of these things. Um, the, the other question is that can the Afghans um, take their money out of Afghanistan? Uh, in, in general, I mean, we, we have throughout the years, all the refugee families that we have been serving from more than 20 or 30 different countries they, they come here with uh, zero to minimal savings with them. Some of, of uh, refugee families, they are, uh, uh, you know, they have the luxury of taking some clothes with them and some personal items. Uh, but the ones who are coming here, um, they, they don't have any cash and they don't have any money with them. And that's, you know, why we, and help them in the beginning and start building their lives, uh, their lives here. Thanks, Ali. Um, just maybe if while we have you here as well, there was a question that came through, where are families being uh, housed? Suburbs, city, I think especially faith communities have that in mind if they're really looking as like a faith community to be able to sponsor a family. So, uh, Greg, the vast majority of our refugees in general, they are in the southwest area of Houston, uh, Gulfton, Sharpstown, uh, Fondren, Brazewood, uh, West Chase. Um, and historically, this area has been, um, you know, you can find uh, uh, ethnic stores. Um, you can find uh, communities from different backgrounds. Uh, it's accessible by the uh, public transportation and, and uh, all of these things. So, Historically, the southwest area has been um, the uh, area in the city where we place most of our refugees. Greg, can I chime in something about the uh, family adoption here? Um, actually, let me let, let, let me actually just ask um, Ali to just respond quickly. To, okay. There was one, one additional question, and then Tamina, we'll have time for you just real fast. Is there um, how much is totally how much total money is needed for six months of rent? I mean, maybe this goes also into the, the sponsorship question for Ali. Right. So, in, in general, Greg, um, the sponsorship for six months of rent, uh, family of four, two bedroom apartment with the housing prices right now, we are lucky if we get an apartment for 1200. So this is like 7,200 for six months, but the sponsorship congregation or uh, any faith community that would like to sponsor refugee families. We have, there are other funding sources, public benefits can cover some of it. Uh, sponsorship uh, congregation will, will cover um, some of it. So it's a, it's a guidance of 
what would uh, and, and how much it takes to sponsor a refugee family. And the reality is you can spend, if you want to go deep into services, they need many things. Um, but we, the way we look at it is that, especially with the Afghan refugees, Afghan uh, parolees, it's an emergency land. It's not a typical refugee resettlement where we have luxury and time to provide all the items that they need, all the cultural um, rugs and cookware that they need. The reality is we are expecting three to 5,000 in Houston. And th this is a large number. Houston has the ability to do yep. this. And we've done this before. It's just a matter of how um, uh, the time frame that they will be coming. Super, thank you. Uh, Tamina, let me turn to you. I just want to be mindful of our time as well. So would love just your, your, your strongest, fastest plug regarding sponsorship. Thank you, Ali. So I just wanted to share my own experiences from the past couple of weeks that I'm being involved with these families, uh, Greg. Uh, definitely, as uh, Ali has mentioned, the parolee families need much more of uh, the support. Uh, I'm also seeing that they are challenged with the language much more than the SIV families. And what I, I've seen, they, there are a few friends who have gone ahead and sponsored a few families. And what I've seen is they are taking them not only to the regular stores, but ethnically, the culturally sensitive uh, grocery shopping they're being able to do as well. And what that allows them to do is teach them the process of shopping itself and interaction at the same time. So I would definitely uh, uh, recommend people who are wanting to maybe do groceries for them, if you, they can, once the background check is done at IM, they can go and take the family for shopping, where it is they can, and they can introduce them to the system of how to do this. And of course they get what they actually are going to be using. Because I am looking at things, we have a lot of stuff here at IM, and we need volunteers maybe to deliver the stuff that we already have to these families and maybe focus on other things that the family needs. So definitely, uh, even the past two days, there were two families that were taken by volunteers and they had a great experience just going out of the house with them. Uh, and that, that is what I just wanted to let the audience know that it is making a difference as we speak. Super, thank you, Tamina. Um, thank you all uh, to all of our panelists, um, Martin Kaminsky, Elena Corbett, Tamina Masood, Oren Hyon. I just want to thank all of you for being on. I'd like to give Martin the closing word, uh, as well as to make our final kind of plug on the things that can be helpful in this time. Martin. Well, thank you all for being on the call and to my fellow panelists who are doing so much to support our work. Uh, as they say, it takes a village to bring an Afghan village to Houston. And we are so fortunate. One of the things that we realized is that this is a big job and one that not just interfaith ministries can do alone. We have several other partners in the community that are involved in the resettlement of Afghans. And we're very fortunate that we all decided to come together and build a collaborative to be able to uh, assist in supporting the needs of the whole Houston community. So I just wanted to mention how grateful I am to our partners, the Alliance, the YMCA, and Catholic Charities of the Archdiocese of Galveston, Houston. We're all working together, sharing in resources, and I want to take a moment to acknowledge three foundations who've done an amazing, generously job of supporting our work. And that's the Houston Endowment, uh, also the Kinder Foundation, and the Ting Sung and Wei Fong Chow Foundation. Those three foundations, along with individuals, have come together to give us $3.3 million to prepare us to support uh, the Afghans in our community. And it's only through these kinds of collaborations and bringing together uh, the community that we can get big jobs like this done for new people coming to Houston. You can help. Don't forget, uh, if you uh, want to share dollars, you can go to uh, our website uh, and do that. 
The Amazon wish list, I believe, is in the chat room. Uh, it has some specific items that we need. I'm always reminding people that federal funds can't be used to buy televisions and radios because that's considered entertainment. But it's one of the most important things that a new immigrant can have when they're learning about our culture and want to hear the news. So if you'd like to buy a TV or any appliance on the wish list, that's great. Volunteer Houston is the place you can volunteer your time or be in touch directly with Elena, who's put her email in the box. Uh, we need people to do all sorts of things. And it is so fulfilling to meet a family as they come to America, uh, see the richness that they're able to take advantage of right away, uh, have a new home, a new place to live with food, furniture, and everything they need. So be a part of that. If you can consider the family sponsorship that Tamina mentioned, we welcome families or congregations of faith or any group that could come together and provide some uh, direct support and friendship to these new Afghans will be helpful. To Greg, I thank you for moderating today. And I uh, think that completes my remarks. Martin, thank you so much. And I also thank you to um, our Impulse Young Professionals and Empower Women's Group here at Interfaith Ministries that are also been helpful. Let me um, just share a quick 30 second video from Sangha to close our time. First of all, I'm very thankful and uh, say thank you from uh, our, to people of Houston and US. Uh, they give us opportunity to live here I want to uh, reach and uh, my wish and my hopes and that I have uh, to uh, improve my education. I wish my children have a nice future here. Uh, so uh, that's my uh, story and that is our hopes and wish. So let me just say thank you all for being here today. Um, you can learn more about our work at imgh.org, where you can especially learn about our refugee resettlement work and how to support us. Thank you again to Sitco Petroleum Corporation for sponsoring this episode and this series. Thanks for being with us. Have a wonderful rest of your day.